my brief this afternoon is to talk a bit about mindfulness, and we could talk a lot about it, but probably one way to get into it is actually to do some straight away. Um, so uh, if you're willing to uh, play along, then let's do a short, brief, one or two minute meditation. Um, so lower your gaze, perhaps, or you can close your eyes if you like. And if, you, if it's possible, see if you can put both feet on the ground so you can actually feel the ground. And, of course, if you don't want to do this, that's fine. Nobody else knows what you're doing. So if you want to go to sleep, that's also fine. And see if it's possible now to put your attention down in your feet. So taking the spotlight of attention down into the feet and see what you notice when your attention gets there. What does your attention find? There may be tingling, pins and needles, warmth. So this is not thinking about the feet so much as noticing from the inside, the experience, moment by moment. And then allowing that attention to expand to the legs. So from the feet, right up the calves, calf muscles, shin bones, including the knees and the thighs, until you notice the contact with the chair, whatever you're sitting on. What sensations are here? And then allow the attention to expand again to the, to the upper torso, so the hips and the abdomen and up the chest, and then the arms as well, including the arms and hands, and then the neck and head. So that now, see if it's possible to hold the whole body in awareness, just as it is. Now, we're not trying to achieve any special state. So if you can't relax, that's fine. Just noticing how you are right now, sort of taking, taking the temperature of the body, if you will, or noticing the weather pattern in the body. Agitated, sleepy, restless, relaxed, whatever it is. See if it's possible to allow it to be exactly as you find it. And now, beginning to move fingers and toes, and if your eyes have been closed, letting them open again and taking in the room again. So one of the things we notice about mindfulness is it's really quite simple. That is, there's nothing there about noticing that, first of all, you have something called attention, like this sort of searchlight of attention. Uh, secondly, that you can direct it in certain ways. You can direct it to various places in the room, um, or you can direct it inside the body, and then you can direct it in very particular ways, particular parts of the body, and you can expand it. There's like a, a bit of a zoom lens on it as well. So it can be very, very narrowly focused, or it can be very, very open and very broad. So already you can notice that quality of attention. You may also notice that although it's really simple, to begin to direct your attention in certain parts of the body or the world, that actually often, I don't know whether you notice this, the mind wanders. So that it's usually only a few seconds after you start this sort of little meditation episode and your mind goes on to perhaps what you're supposed to do when you finished here or what you did this morning or maybe what am I doing here? I thought I was going to hear a lecture. This is weird. Uh, how soon can I get out of here? Uh, whatever. And the mind then goes off on a trip on its own. And actually, when that happens, it turns out that that is really helpful. Because what this mindfulness meditation practice is all about is noticing the patterns of the mind, but with some sort of anchor on the breath or the body or something, some anchor which means that there's just a chance that you'll notice eventually that the mind has gone. 
and that it isn't where you had intended it to be. And then there's the resolution, OK, well, let's just bring it back. And that going away and coming back is actually what the practice is about. It's not about clearing the mind, getting relaxed or whatever. It's about finding an anchor and then being able to look and see clearly the patterns of the mind from that anchor. Some people have likened it to um, trying to steady a boat. Sometimes if you're trying to look at the stars through a telescope or a, or, or a binoculars, um, it's rather difficult to do if you're on the open sea or a lake on a rowing boat because you wouldn't be able to hold the thing still. You wouldn't get to see very much. So if you could anchor it or if you could even draw the boat up onto the beach so it's solid, then there's a chance that when you look, you'll see more distinctly. And so in a sense, mindfulness is about steadying attention so that you can see more clearly the patterns of the mind. And then there's a greater chance, chance it'll enable us to do the sort of things that um, we've just heard about in, in Ella's talk about making peace with your experiences rather than being um, a victim of your experiences. And it's that shift I want to talk about a little bit and how mindfulness might help in it. So what is mindfulness? I'll talk first of all about the definition of it, and then I'll come to the way in which we've mostly been using it in our research and work that we've been doing, practical work at Oxford, which is to see how much or how little it can help people who've been recurrently depressed, and then try to understand <coughs> why it is that mindfulness might be helpful, as it seems to be, by focusing on things that um, are relatively automatic in the mind, which when brought into the light of mindfulness, people can see more clearly and have more choices about what happens uh, in the mind. Um, later on, we may talk about some of the evidence that we've collected on uh, why it works, how it works, and also some things about the particular uh, group of people with particular experiences in the past in whom it seems to work very well. And that's another way in which it'll, it'll uh, tie up with the talk we've already heard. So first of all, then, the definition of mindfulness. I suppose at its simplest level, you could call it a training in attention. We've just discovered that you have an attention and it can be directed in various ways. It's about training in attention, systematic training, and we tend to do this over eight weeks and people to practice every day, so that uh, distractions are not so distracting, so that especially compelling distractions that would take us away from what it, we intended to be doing are not so compelling or distracting. And the use of it now in schools is, is particularly valued because, uh, especially kids in schools, they have so many things that distract them that actually the business of just paying attention to one thing at a time is quite difficult. And in many of our jobs, we are asked to multitask. I was talking to someone from Goldman Sachs the other day in which he said he had four screens in front of him and that bottom screen was emails and the Goldman Sachs culture is you've got to answer an email within 30 seconds. But in the other screen were all the prices from around the world of various things, which you had to be vigilant for, because if you missed a trend, you might actually lose the company a lot of money or lose your clients a lot of money, even worse. Probably the same thing, actually. Um, so you had to attend to all these things. And multitasking was the, the, the nature of, the, of that job. And in fact, they would admire the people that could multitask the most in that setting. Some people were really good at actually doing that, it seemed. Um, but interestingly, Although they'd learned to multitask, they'd forgotten how to single task, how to just do one thing at a time. And their partners often complained about that. Um, <laughs> in fact, if you want to know how you're doing, ask your partner. Don't ask yourself. Ask a good friend, and they'll tell you whether your multitasking is just getting on top of them, even if you think you're pretty good at it. <laughs> so training attention is the first thing. I think the second thing about uh, mindfulness is it's then using that attentional stability, a bit like pulling the rowing boat up onto the sand so you've got something stable, to use that attention stability to become aware of the sources of distraction, their nature, seeing their habitual patterns, seeing the signatures, seeing how we're reacting to them and how we have experiences, and then very soon afterwards we have a reaction to that experience which actually can, can be something like, I don't like this, I want to get rid of it, and the reaction to it can actually make it worse than it orig originally was. So you can see that more clearly, but it's helpful to be attentionally stable to see it more clearly. And thirdly, learning to respond to these patterns of reactivity with greater wisdom and uh, 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 compassion. 
so that we don't respond to them as we tend to habitually do with lots of harsh judgment about what a bad person I am to even have these experiences, um, which for some reason doesn't quite help. It actually makes them intrude even more. So the sort of pull yourself together brigade, it doesn't tend to um, help very much. So in talking about why and how this is needful, my, I became aware of mindfulness and particularly John Cabot's work in chronic pain, when my colleagues John Teasel and Zindel Segan and I had uh, uh, realized that one of the big problems in our field, which is uh, therapy for depression, was meeting a new problem that hadn't, we hadn't been aware of before. We'd been involved in doing research on cognitive therapy for depression, which turned out to be quite effective, um, as effective as antidepressants, not necessarily more so or less so, and so people thought it was a sort of a settled deal. Cognitive therapy and indeed other therapies are quite good at alleviating the uh, symptoms of, if you take the medical model, or the experience of depression. Depression, the experience of depression, as you know, have these core features of sadness, hopelessness, on the one hand, sort of mood features. Uh, but it also had these core experiences of not being interested in things, not getting, having any get up and go at all, especially for things that you once used to enjoy. They often have seemed the most aversive, the most difficult. And that's particularly painful, that your, your most valued hobbies and friends, now you don't want to see them, you don't want to do uh, anything uh, about that. But also another cluster of experiences around eating, around sleeping, problems, um, around feeling very agitated or slowed down, very tired a lot of the time, feeling guilty and worthless, not being able to concentrate, feeling suicidal. That cluster of experiences, when they co-occur, may get a diagnosis of clinical depression, when they co-occur and they stay around a long time. And typically they stay around between four, six or eight months at a time, then they get better by themselves, they spontaneously remit. Um, and that was the pattern until that we thought until the 60s and 70s that depression was episodic, they saw. And you have an episode and then it would get better spontaneously. The treatments then, the aim of treatments was to try and speed up the natural healing process. It was going to get better by itself, but if you used antidepressants or cognitive therapy, you'd get better maybe in 12 weeks rather than uh, take six months. So what was the new challenge then in the 80s and 90s? It was discovery that whereas depression tended in the early part of the 20th century and beyond, earlier than that, to be a sort of a problem mostly besetting people in late middle age, the age of onset of depression was getting younger and younger. So that by the time we looked at the data in the 1980s, people thought that there had been probably people who were now getting depressed in their 30s. By the 90s, it seemed to have slipped to, the, um, to even younger. And typically now... Uh, the, the, the modal age of onset, that means the most common age at which depression, that cluster of symptoms and experiences that I described, the most common age when it starts is between 13 and 15 years old. And one of the consequences of that happening is, um, well, one consequence is that by 18 to 21, between half and 75% of people who are ever going to get depressed in their life have already been depressed once or twice. That's a huge change on notice, for example, by student mental health services or well-being services, that people are already coming to university or for postgraduate study or for their first job already with a, with a history that um, have very, very sort of difficult experiences to cope with. But the other consequence of it is that you begin to see now what the lifetime course of this cluster of, of experiences can can give. And it looks as if that once you have one depression, the, a second one is about 50% likely. So you don't have to have, it's not inevitable there'll be another depression, uh, but uh, it may happen. But if you then have a second depression or a third, the likelihood of, of more actually goes up. And the, uh, as we've heard from Eleanor, a lot of these things happen with trauma. And maybe the first depression happens with a, a trauma or adversity. The second one needs less. The third one even needs less. But it, begun, it begins to get autonomous. That is, you don't need very much trauma later on to precipitate all these cluster of experiences again. So by the 1980s, people realized that the problem was not just depression needing to be treated when you were actually <coughs> depressed. 
It was, we need to understand what is it that keeps people at risk, even in between uh, an episode of depression, that makes the next episode more likely, and what can we do to, to help people become of lower risk. The analogy that sometimes uses is the fire brigade. If you have a fire in your house and you call the fire brigade, they will come and put out the fire, and then you'll go away, they'll go away, and you'll never see them again, hopefully. If you had another fire, in 18 months after that, they would come, you'd shine 999, they'd put out the fire, hopefully no damage would have been done, maybe, and they'd go away again. If you had a third fire in 18 months, then they would start to wonder, and they might send a fire officer around to ask, what's going on in your house that means you're vulnerable to have fires? The fire officer would not come round in the middle of the blaze, That wouldn't, because they can't do an investigation in the middle of the blaze. What you need then is the fire brigade, maybe. Uh, you need the help for that particular episode. But then the fire officer would come and say, where's the vulnerability and can we somehow help to um, reduce that risk? And what my colleagues and I were looking for is a way of helping to reduce the risk of depression. So we invited people... Um, uh, in between episodes of depression, who we knew to be vulnerable because they'd had more, two, three, four, most of them, 75%, had had three or more episodes of depression in the past. So we knew that the next 12 months, since they'd had the last episode rather recently, the next 12 months was going to be a critical time. And we went to see John Kabat-Zinn and asked him about his eight-week program that he developed for chronic pain, for mindfulness for chronic pain, mindfulness-based stress reduction, and adapted it for people who... Uh, were vulnerable for depression and, and offered it to them. But one of the startling things we found when we started this work was that people didn't actually know what the ongoing risk was. Why is it that people who've been depressed once get depressed again? So we had to look back in the psychology literature to look at our own research, to ask uh, people and, and, and allow all these sources of information to converge. And it begins to tell a very interesting story that these are normal processes of the mind that have somehow got hijacked by the difficult things that have happened. So there's nothing abnormal about uh, the mind in depression. These are normal processes that actually come online to try to help get over a sadness or a, a difficulty, but just because of the way the mind works, it tends to backfire. What do I mean by that? Well... Let's take a, an example from an old experiment that was done in the 1980s by some colleagues of mine that used to work with me at the Applied Psychology Unit in Cambridge, as it used to be called. Um, the Applied Psychology Unit was funded by the Medical Research Council to try to answer practical problems by the use of psychology. And one of the practical problems, because uh, it came partly from the Industrial Psychology Unit in, the, in, the war, in wartime, one of the practical problems they had then wasn't anything to do with depression at all. It was... Um, divers in the North Sea forgetting the information when they were down under the water fixing the rigs. So the North Sea was opening up, very, very big source of uh, e uh, economic good and benefit for Scotland and possibly the rest of the United Kingdom. The rest of the United Kingdom, maybe Scotland. Uh, so, but these divers were going down, forgetting the information they had, to, they had to learn, they had to remember. So they called in the psychologist the brave people, and they asked them, can, they, can you help us understand what's going on? Well, the obvious explanation is that you learn what you've got to do and all the serial numbers and this sort of thing on, on the dry land. Then you go down into really dark, murky depths. It's dark down there, and actually, who would remember that information? Um, it may be just be difficult. But they did an experiment to see, and they found that, yes, you did forget the information, but when you came back up on the beach, you remembered it again. And then they did the reverse experiment. They asked divers to learn some material when they were underwater, which they could do, come on the beach, and guess what? They didn't rem remember it so well on the beach. So all the conditions of the beach were fine. When they went back underwater, they remembered it better. So you see the pattern that's emerging. Wherever you learn the information, you can recall it better when you get back into that situation. So learn it on the beach, Forget it underwater. When you come back on the beach, you remember it again. Learn it underwater. Come on the beach, you don't remember it so well. Go back underwater. Oh, it comes back to you. So this is a bit like going upstairs when you've forgotten something, yeah? And then forgetting what you've come for. What do you do? You have to go back downstairs. 
then you get back into the kitchen and you remember it, yeah? You could yo-yo a long time doing that. <laughs> but generally speaking, you attend more and then you go back. So where you remember something, and of course, you know, going back to a childhood home that you haven't visited for years and years and years, you know, you suddenly remember stuff. Going back into the context brings back memories. Now, what's become apparent is that just like going back into the water for these divers made them remember what they'd learned underwater, going back to your childhood place makes you learn, or going upstairs, going downstairs, mood can act like that sort of context. Mood can act like that context. So when you get a little bit depressed, what happens is the sadness can bring with it all the things that you last remembered, thought, or was happening to you when you were last there. And if your first depression is, comes out in the context of bullying or trauma or difficulties or neglect, such as we were hearing earlier, then even if you get over it, if for some people, if they feel just a little bit sad, that's like diving back into the water. It can bring back the, not only the memories, but all the attitudes, all the sense of helplessness, all the sense of being bullied, of having no friends. So whether you're in your 20s or 30s or 40s, even if you've got lots of friends, what will happen is you'll be overwhelmed with the feeling that you have no friends. Overwhelmed with feelings that you're no good, that you're at the bottom of the heap, that nobody loves you, that you're outside the, the group. Um, and that that itself explains quite a lot of why depression keeps recurring. Because lots of experiments show that people who've been depressed once are more prone with little tiny bits of sadness for that sadness to bring back those full-blown things that were learned, experienced, and so on um, at, the, at the time uh, that um, the depression first started. So that sort of mood and memory phenomenon turns out to be really important. Now, we can do various things when that happens, and almost all of them turn out to be counterproductive. I mean, you can go and just blind yourself with alcohol. Not, not, you know, a little bit, fine, but too much just blots out a lot of other things that you might actually need to remember. Um, you could try and suppress the material coming back into your mind. But suppression doesn't always work either, as we know from the pink elephant experiments. You just tell somebody, for the next minute, do not think of a pink elephant. And guess what happens? Well, you found it yourself. If I tell you now, do not think of a pink elephant, then probably for the next minute, even if you conceded and not think about pink elephant, as soon as the minute was up, you'd think of nothing else. So, and that's because you have to keep a note in your mind of what you're not supposed to be thinking about. Yes? Don't mention the war. Do you remember that? Um, it's the same thing. You know, whatever, if you keep a note of what you're not thinking about, you've already got a representation of that in your head. So suppression, alcohol, not very good. Now, there's another subtle thing, but this happens automatically. There's an experiment done by some Swedish psychologists on autobiographical memories for, uh, evoked by smells. Now, you know that smell is a very powerful um, bringer back of memories. So um, if I gave you the smell of mulled wine, for example, I mean, already you're thinking, oh, well, that's better than being here anyway. Um, the smell of mulled wine or... Um, the smell of cloves, for example. Why these are all related to Christmas, I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> cloves, mold, yeah. Um, so you can, you can do experiments in which you just give people those smells, and co what comes back are often very old memories, very powerful memories uh, for the person. You can do it even with words. Just give the word cloves or mulled wine, and people are pretty good at thinking about memories. Actually, when you give them the words, the memories aren't so strong. There are more of them, but they're not so strong. And what these uh, people um, did in the university in Sweden is they uh, pitted these against each other, got those, replicated those results, but then they had a condition in which you both gave somebody the experience, but with the label. You know, so it's mulled wine smell, and then the label, mulled wine. What they found was that the language, the label, trumped the smell in the sense that the memories that then came up with the real smell of the label were much more like just labeling it. In other words, the memories were not so intense when it was activated by words compared with the actual experience of smelling. It had taken some of the pleasantness out of it, the intensity out of it. You might say taken some of the sting out of it. The word, the concept, the idea of something <clears throat> is a useful thing that we humans have, 
but it removes some of the pain of it. So what can happen is that many people that have a lot of painful experiences actually move up into a sort of world in which they end up thinking about the pain as an alternative to re-experiencing it. And that can be really helpful for people from time to time, but it tends, again, if it becomes a habit, to backfire because it becomes a sort of preoccupation, a brooding, a, a what we call rumination, and that can make things worse. One of the distinctive things, however, is that rumination is going on in the head. And therefore, it suggests that there might be something we could do about it of enabling people to stay with what's going on but actually work through it through the body. And that's what mindfulness attempts to do. So I just want to pause for a moment, and we'll do another meditation in a moment, but I just want to summarise where we've got to. We're looking at the problem of recurrence in depression... We're um, seeing whether mindfulness has a role to play. And particularly, we're looking at the fact that when difficult things happen, sad moods can activate a whole complex of memories, and that the mind has different ways of responding to those memories and those experiences, one of which is suppression, which doesn't work very well, but the other is to use sort of overthinking or conceptual structures, which appears at first sight to lessen the blow of the actual experiences, because you're now thinking about it rather than re-experiencing it. But this brooding and rumination often just spreads into other associations. So what I want to do now is to do another meditation in which I just want you to notice the patterns of your own mind. So we really want mind-wandering to happen here. So if you think meditation is about clearing the mind, then no. I want you just to, we'll give you an anchor, say on the breath, but just for two or three minutes, just notice when the mind goes off, where does it go? What associations does it have? <coughs> and now probably, having invited your mind to wander, guess what? Maybe your mind won't wander at all. <coughs> Maybe this is the treatment we've all been looking for. Tell your mind to wander. Okay, so once again, your feet flat on the floor if you'd like to do this, so you can really notice. The children in the schools call this fofbok, feet on floor, bum on chair. <laughs> As christened by school children. So... So let's letting your gaze be lowered or eyes closed, if that feels comfortable to you, but it's okay if not. And notice the head and neck balanced on the shoulders, and the shoulders can be dropped, the spine long, and feeling the feet on the floor and the pressure of the chair on the thighs and buttocks. And then gathering your attention to the breath. Just notice the sensations of breathing. Now, you may notice the breath in the nose, in the nostrils, the cold air coming in, the warm air going out. So that's one place where you may follow the breath. Or you may feel the breath in the back of the throat, or the chest, or you may feel it, feel it right down in the abdomen. It doesn't really matter where you feel it most vividly, but, but maybe just staying with one place where you feel the breath, just choosing one of those places and staying with it there for a few moments. So... Noticing the raw physical sensations of breathing. Once again, not trying to control the breath in any way or trying to achieve anything. Simply allowing the breath to breathe itself. And very often when we do this work, the mind begins to wander. So if you notice that the mind's gone off somewhere, just notice where it went, perhaps the chain of associations that it began to generate. Just notice them, and then, when you're ready, escorting the attention back to the breath and starting again, and seeing if it happens again.
mind goes off, and we gently escort it back without giving yourself a hard time. If you have a mind, it will wander. Noticing where it went, bring it back. So in the last few moments of this meditation, just coming back to the breath. And then beginning to move fingers and toes and letting the eyes open if they've been closed and taking the room again. Maybe now just for two or three minutes, just turn to your neighbour in twos and threes or turn around, whatever, introduce yourself so you don't know, and just <coughs> say, say as much or as little about your experience of your mind wandering and coming back and mind wandering coming back, um, of what you noticed about that short meditation. So just um, now for two or three minutes, um, find somebody you don't know, perhaps you do, <laughs> and move up close. If you're not sitting next to somebody, just close up the car. want to shout out anything that you found particularly noteworthy, just shout it out and I'll repeat it for the purpose of the video. Anybody want to share their experience with the whole group? I was, I was running errands in Leeds thinking of what I could do for um, working towards the dissertation, so collecting books from the library and, and making sure I've got everything. So running errands in Leeds, yeah. going to the library, everything you need for your dissertation. Okay, so then it went to the articles at home, to with all the highlighting. Absolutely. So this is a really good example. Thanks so much. So it started, first of all, with the breath, yeah? Well, maybe for a fraction of a second of the breath. And then uh, leads to different places. So your mind did not want some mental time travel. Yeah, kind of because I think, how much parking have we got? So what can I do in that parking time? How much parking? Okay. So we had the parking issue as well. This is a very entertaining life. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, and you're going to do it tomorrow. So, but already your mind was doing planning, okay, remembering things that you had to do. This is a really important feature of the mind, you know, that the mind has this <coughs> sense of uh, the unfinished business. Um, after all, we need that because this is, this is what I was saying about um, it's not the mind's mistake that it runs off. 
It's actually what we need it to be doing, working the background reminders of things. Of course, when it's finished with what you're doing tomorrow and all this dissertation stuff, if it actually settled that, there'd be stuff perhaps from last year or the year before or something like that, or that novel you meant to write by the time you were 30 or 40 or whatever. Absolutely. So it can do all sorts of remindings. Thank you. Yeah. Any other sort of little cascade of associations? Maybe one more. The breathing felt heavy, yeah? Um, and then that made me start to think that I need to lose weight and therefore I need to go get the shopping list so that I can decide what to have for dinner. Okay. <laughs> so, like, it's uh, breathing felt heavy, I need to lose weight, get the shopping list, prepare dinner. So, yeah. And that, did it stop there or did you come back to the breath or did and you go I further? I was actually thinking about tomorrow's night dinner and then I was thinking, but I don't know what I'm going to have tonight instead. So, tomorrow's night's dinner you were thinking of. <laughs> so, then tonight. Then tonight. So okay. Then Okay, so what else is going to the supermarket? My boy, uh, find out if he needed anything. <laughs> okay, so messaging, uh, did, you, did you find your hand almost going to your phone to message your boyfriend? No, I had to write down what I needed to ask him if he wanted before I forgot it. Okay, so, okay, so if, for those who didn't hear it, so there's a, a little sort of um, scenario playing out here, which is, starts with a sort of heavy, uh, breathing feeling heavy, sense of needing to lose weight, sense of actually what am I going to buy, sense of needing to check with boyfriend what he wants, sense of actually, oh, it's tomorrow night or is it tonight? And then the sense of I'm to write down what, it's a lot of stuff. And at what point did you sort of catch yourself saying, oh, this isn't where I intended my mind to be? Right, when you but needed to write down when you're going to ask him. Wake up and do that, and then I can start again. Okay, so I'd better get that done, and then I'll start the meditation again. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's a very common thing that we think, oh, our mind's gone so far, we've, we've lost it now, so we'll just do that, then start again. And so one of the discoveries is that actually one can just let that sort of, it becomes so compelling to do something about it that it gives you a really good opportunity to notice what compulsion feels like. Um, so you could write it down, um, but actually um, it also provides an opportunity for you just to sit there and go, oh, let's just have a look at this. Let's have a look at this, because actually learning about these patterns whereby we get driven by the habits of mind um, often means that we don't notice that we might have choices there, that actually writing a message to a boyfriend or planning the meal or whatever might be just one of the number of possible things that you might need to do but we often don't think about the possibility we just do one of them because that seems the most important thing to do. So what mindfulness does isn't mean that you have to just sit there solemnly you know, for hours and hours and then whatever's happening. And it's a nice song. Um, <laughs> that, that, that you don't, it actually gives you choice. If it comes, turns out to be really important to remember it, of course you can sort of write it down. But also you might say, right, the, the feeling I must get this, otherwise I'm going to forget it is something I might recognise as a habit that affects my life in other situations too. So let's let that feeling be there in my laboratory of my mindfulness practice so I can just notice where, how my body's involved in that, how my arm's beginning to move, how my mind's beginning to say, I can't rest until I've done this. Because although that might be a small example, the spirit and the theory of this is that those small habits that show up in our mindfulness practice are often examples of what happens in the outside world as well. And that's especially true, so thank you very much indeed. That's especially true of people who've been through depression many times, that the habits that show up in a mindfulness practice, like I'm no good at this, this is stupid, this is not really for me, um, that this is stupid, this is not really for me, is not just about the practice. That might have been when they were at their first disco at university, or that might have been when they walked into the room in the first year lecture theatre, or it might be halfway through the course, or whatever, a very powerful feeling which doesn't feel it has the choice there. It feels that I, you, know, you feel completely helpless and abandoned. So having examined these little, little habits of mind, you get more prepared to deal with the big ones when they come. So thank you. Thank you for those examples of the associations. <clears throat> what we saw in both examples there is one elegant feature of the mind, um, which philosophers call counterfactual reasoning. Um, and that is where the mind fills up with things that haven't happened yet or that have happened but it could have gone otherwise. Um, I was in Schiphol Airport a few years ago 
and Schiphol Airport has its railway track underneath the airport concourse, so it's very easy to access the airport in Amsterdam. Um, and so they, it, it isn't very far down, so they don't have escalators, they have moving walkways. You know these walkways that you stride along feeling like you're making great progress? Um, with that voice at the end saying, step off now. Um, well, in Amsterdam, they, they just bend down to the, uh, to the, to the railway, uh, which is great, except if, as somebody standing in front of me had, was two large suitcases with a wheel at four corners. And with a large suitcase with a wheel at four corners, they're really sort of easy to use when it's flat, but difficult to use when it's slopey. And indeed, the bigger of these two cases set off without its owner, <laughs> down, hurtling towards the, uh, the platform. And I said, I'll hold this one. You go after it. So he went after it. And uh, he disappeared. Well, the case gathered pace faster than he did. <laughs> so the case disappeared around the corner. And I was thinking, oh, my God, what's going to happen there? Because a big, big case, these things, you know? Um, and very heavy. Uh, when, by the time I got there, he... Luckily, the platform was deserted. He was standing on the edge of the platform, looking down on his case, which had scooted right across, was now falling, on, which was now lying on the railway track. So we looked around for a sort of a, a somebody with a peaked hat, and uh, um, and there was nobody, no official around at all. And we thought, well, if a train comes in, rail, well, it's going to be a problem. So we stood looking at each other, looking at the case, <laughs> looking to see if we could spot an electric line. Um, Though, what did we know? <laughs> I haven't got a clue. But anyway, we eventually, in our wisdom, diagnosed la no electric line. Um, and then <laughs> I said, you know, I think you're going to have to go down and fetch it. I'll hold your bag. <laughs> in a moment of great bravery. And so he let down, picked it up, put it back, let back up, and we were back to normal. And th it was then he realized he was actually on the wrong uh, platform, and he <laughs> trundled off to find the right platform. And what I know, because it happened to me all that day and several, several months afterwards, is the what if. Like, it had all happened really happily. But you can be plagued by what if there'd been people there? What if that, you know, had knocked? What if there'd been train coming in? What if this? What if that? Counterfactual reasoning is the what ifs. And so a lot of our thinking is what if. Like, oh, what if I went today rather than tomorrow? What if I did tomorrow's menu rather than today's? What if I did this? What would this? And, and it's a beautiful, elegant aspect of the mind. But it also has another variant, which is if only, especially with the past. If only I hadn't done that. If only they hadn't done that. And the what ifs of this if only can create such a, um, a sort of a complex of imaginative stories in our mind. I mean, we all know it, the what-ifs, I suppose, the middle of the night thinking is what we mostly recognize. Even if we've never been depressed or never had any sort of big sort of clinical problem in our lives, we know what it's like to be awake in the middle of the night, not being able to get to sleep, when ideas are churning round and round and round. And very often, it's a planning, it's a what-if, or if only, or, or um, uh, it's a, it can be very damaging. And yet, the mind is doing the best it can. It's trying to problem solve. It's trying to think of all the other scenarios that might be. And in its problem solving attempts, it can create more mayhem than you had at the start. So we know that people that have trauma, for example, end up with a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. For example, after a road traffic accident or after an assault. Um, very often, not only have flashbacks to cope with of the actual event itself, which is bad enough, but there's often a whole array of what ifs or if onlys. If only I hadn't walked down that street. If only I hadn't driven that route. If only, or what if, or sometimes even things that didn't happen, like what if I'd been killed? What would happen to my children? And they, you can be just as tortured by the if onlys and what ifs, by the counterfactuals, as by the event that happened itself, as if that wasn't bad enough. And the, 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 um, the ways in which different sort of therapeutic modes tackle this, they tackle it in different ways. And mindfulness is not just a panacea which is going to work for everything and elbows out everything else that's ever been tried, because clearly there are many different ways of dealing with this. But what mindfulness does is invite you, first of all, to notice those associations when they're not so strong. Even this in a two-minute meditation, you begin to notice those associations. 
and begin to see those as, as mental events, as actually things that are going on in your head, in your mind, as it were. It's, 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 your experience is real, but it's not necessarily the truth of things. And this business about inventing a, 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 an imagined scenario and then feeling all the grief of that scenario to add to the grief of what already has happened to us is something that mindfulness addresses. Counterfactual reasoning, this rumination and preoccupation can be all pervasive. And what psychologists now tell us is actually our preoccupations, it's, they are, they're with us all the time. I mean, it's not just a question of big trauma or events at Schiphol Airport. We actually go around in our living in our heads quite a lot of the time. You know, if, we're, if we want a cup of tea and we notice, oh, there's no, there's no clean cup, so we clean the cups to wash the, to wash the dishes to get a clean cup for our cup of tea before we go out shopping and, <laughs> and getting the stuff in for tomorrow or going to the library. Or... Well, you know, cleaning the cup is irrelevant because it's the cup of tea we're looking for. So we're focused on the cup of tea we're going to have rather than the cleaning the cups. So we miss the cleaning of the cups. We miss the water. We miss the... The, the feel of the water on our hands. You know, from the age of three, probably, when we messed about and our t parents told us not to, we probably haven't felt the water on our hands very much because so, we're focused on the tea. But where is your mind when you're having that cup of tea? That's the question. You've planned the tea when you're doing the... You've missed the washing. This is Thich Nhat Hanh's example, the Vietnamese monk. Probably when you're drinking the tea, your mind is on your shopping. And so you end up with, like, an empty cup thinking, oh... Oh, did I just drink that, or did somebody else drink it? I don't remember drinking that tea. Um, and so you've got an empty cup. So you've just missed the dishes, and you've just missed the cup of tea, and then you drive to the or walk to the supermarket or whatever, and you miss the walk because you're thinking about what you're going to buy. So you don't, you don't see things around you. And then when you're going around the supermarket, you're thinking how long the queues will be, or whether to use those annoying, automost voices that always get it wrong. Put the bag back. Or, I don't have a bag. I don't have a bag. No, put the bag back. No, honestly, I don't have a bag. Where's the button saying call attendant? Um, oh, there's no button. Oh, there, here comes an attendant. No, it's not attendant. Um, you know, the, all that. You're worried about that. Or if you're standing in a queue, you're thinking, I should have been in that queue. <laughs> so you spend the whole time thinking, if I made a dash to that queue, would I make it in time? Or would, oh, no, somebody's coming. And so you better stay here. And then the person in front of you, they can't get the price of the loaf of bread. So somebody has to go and find the price of the loaf of bread. And so, that's, so then when you're, you're thinking about driving home and then you're thinking about cooking, you're living your whole life actually leaning into the next moment. You know, w walking at that sort of angle, like a Lowry painting, walking, walking at that angle, leaning to the next moment <coughs> rather than actually no even noticing that you're in this one. And the pity of it is that we could wake up in the end of our lives with six months or six weeks to live and look back on our life and say, was that the empty cup? Was that the life? That was it. And I may not get another one. You know, that was it. I've just lived it. Moment by moment by moment, I've sort of willfully sort of squandered my life because I didn't actually notice I was alive. <coughs> Joseph, um, guy who worked on myth for many years and died in the 1980s, uh, has a wonderful quote about, um, in this interaction, somebody said to him, was myths, which stand at the beginning of all cultures, you know, they're very common myths, even though people have been um, living thousands of miles apart, you go back into their myths and they're often very, very similar. And Joseph Campbell had this quote which said that myths are not about finding the meaning of the life. So his question is said, well, are, are they helping us get the meaning of life? And he said, people say they're looking for the meaning of life, but I don't think that's what they're looking for. I think what they're looking for is the experience of being alive. And that's a very different, subtly different, but really important thing. <coughs> it's not about a conceptual thing of understanding life, though wouldn't it be wonderful if we did? It's, and we, but we can get so caught up in our preoccupations of trying to understand that we actually miss our life. Now, when you put all the mindfulness practices together into an eight-week program, as we did in something called mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, offered it to people who had been depressed um, three or more times, 
and in our most recent research find that it cuts the relapse rates over that critical next 12-month period uh, by about half. But it doesn't... Um, some people still relapse. So one of the questions is, who does it work best for? Who get the most benefit? And it turns out that the people who get most benefit are people who have had most trauma in childhood and adolescence. They get the most benefit. Um, but it also turns out that anybody who goes through a mindfulness course has to practice the meditations every day. We looked at how much people practiced, and we found that actually people that practiced more got bigger benefit, did those formal practices day by day. And that was independent of how enthusiastic they were for mindfulness. So some people were really enthusiastic about mindfulness but didn't practice, didn't get much benefit. Some people were a bit grumpy about mindfulness, didn't really want to be there, but they did the practice and they got the benefit. So it sort of reinforces the idea of just actually doing it and experiencing it rather than just thinking about it or planning one day I will do this. <clears throat> and we've also done research to say, well, if people come to classes to do a mindfulness class, is it really the mindfulness which helps them, or is it just coming to class? Well, we had a control group where people just came to class, talking about depression, sharing their experience of depression, but not learning to meditate. And the evidence was it got people about halfway in terms of the relapse rates of over the next uh, 12 months. <coughs> but if, they, if you wanted to take people, to give them the full benefit, people actually had to uh, learn to, to do the meditations and, and then to carry them out. So the research is still investigating what are the mechanisms. It turns out that, just like Eleanor said, what people learn is to be compassionate about their own experience. That as people learn to do the sort of work we've been just sampling today, people actually find a compassion for their own experience growing, a sort of sometimes a sense of humor about where the mind goes, a sense of being able to stand back from the mind to see the thoughts and feelings that come like clouds in the sky, sometimes very black clouds, but something you can see coming and going, and you don't have to take it all personally, as if they're telling the truth about you. You can learn from the themes, as we've been hearing, but not actually think, so, it must be true that I'm a bad person. It, 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 it's about approaching the, the, your own mind and body uh, with compassion. And I want to finish with a sh short meditation, but... Other one or two questions before we get into the, the last meditation and then go off for a break. Any one or two buzz questions? Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, um, looking at um, the way we do drift from <coughs> one point to another point, particularly when meditating. I felt um, we can actually link it to dementia as well. Uh, I, um, there was a time someone was saying um, everybody got the element of dementia and they are actually responsible for forgetfulness and um, sometimes um, anybody can forget in the midst of many things at the same time. Yeah, yeah. So, is it true that um, when, we, when we forget, it's part of dementia? Okay. So, the, um, well, I mean, there's a whole spectrum of forgetfulness. And dementia is when there seems to be a biological process going on that actually means that, it, that we cannot retrieve whole episodes of our life, usually starting from <coughs> fairly recent life, short-term memory goes, and then further back and further back. And although some of those memories can be recovered with some procedures that have now been used in which you take sort of lots of photographs of what people are doing each day from their own perspective and show them, and sometimes you can quite remarkably find that the memory, a little memory comes back, it's actually the memories seem to become really inaccessible. And that seems to be more than just ordinary forgetfulness, though there is a spectrum of forgetfulness. However, there's one thing, I think, for, people, for early dementia sufferers, and that is that sometimes the anxiety and the worry and the sadness, as people um, are aware, or more and more aware of their problem and then get a diagnosis, that we know that anxiety and depression can itself affect memory. Um, with some studies that I did a long time ago with a, with a colleague who was interested in brain damage, young people come off their motorbikes and end up with head injuries and can't remember, often can't remember the episode, but also have memory problems caused by the brain damage. 
we estimated that about half of their memory problems were due to the brain damage and half was due to their worrying and rumination and, and their preoccupation. Sometimes preoccupation with not being able to remember the accident itself. So there is scope, I think, for looking at the forgetfulness that actually we can do something about that's born of the anxiety and depression, um, but without um, uh, um, somehow demeaning the memory problems that people can't very easily do anything about because of the organic process that's going on in dementia. So thank you. Let's finish then with uh, a short sort of two-minute meditation. Um, we'll do a sort of two-minute breathing space. So once again, well, you know what to do now. Feet on the floor. And stepping, this idea of changing the posture to represent a, a stepping out of autopilot. So just noticing noticing what's happening in mind and body right now. And that's the first step of this breathing space, is to notice what's going on. Noticing what's going on in your mind in terms of thoughts or feelings, any sensations in the body. Acknowledging what's going on without trying to change it. And then coming to the breath. So the second step is to gather in the attention and place it one place where you feel the breath moving. And if the mind wanders, simply bringing it back. With great tenderness and compassion for the mind. And then the third step, expanding the attention to the body as a whole, sitting here, aware of the whole body. All the sensations from the top of the head to the bottom of the feet and right out to the surface of the skin. As if the whole body was breathing now. And allowing the body to be just as you find it, just as it is, accepting it as it is. A sense of coming home to this body. A sense of openness and spaciousness. And as best we can, bringing this sense of openness to the next few moments of our day. As we begin to move fingers and toes, allow our eyes to open, taking the room again. Thank you very much indeed for your warm and kind attention. Thank you.